Oh, hey there. Welcome to my office. Didn't see you come in. I'll keep it brief as I can. My name's Detective Jimmy King. And if you don't know me yet, you sure will after this. See, I'm one of the best private dicks in the game today. I take this job so serious that I didn't even laugh when I said dick back there. Got my credentials through the Herschel Walker Academy of Law Enforcement and everything. So what's my beat, you might ask? Well, I track killers. Not like the stabby, shooty kind, though, because that scares me and I don't like being around blood. No, 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 no. No, no I track killers of the more socio-political variety. Now, I've only been doing this for a year now, but don't you be mistaken. I got some big fish to my name. I was the one that exposed Dastardly Dave, who poisoned the financial literacy of all Americans with expired advice and smarmy ideology. I nabbed Preacher Paula, who shot separation of church and state dead in the middle of Fifth Avenue and didn't even lose any of her Southwest Airline miles. And just last month, I finished up my biggest case ever, a months long beat tracking down all four of the minions of Maga. These sick fucks worked together across four states, committing dozens of atrocities against innocent constituents that trusted them. We suspect now that it was all part of some fucked up occult ritual in tribute to their patron demon Maga. First rule of law enforcement, when in doubt, assume satanic cult. But while all these cases were fine, so to speak, I'd still say I was looking for something with a little more pizzazz. So as soon as I double-checked my info and made my capture on the minions, I was already scouting around for my next case. And that's when I got a call from my guy, Ranger Tony Big Man, down in Austin. Oh, no, no, that's, that's Tony's deputy. Huh. Yeah, there he is. That right there is the best crime sniffer west of the Rio Chorizo. Now, Tony, he's got something big going on down there deep in the heart of Texas. Since 2003, the state's been experiencing what can only be described as a strange and sickening rash of attacks against democracy. Major elections won by blithering morons, human rights being slashed up left and right, statewide sprees of national embarrassment, you name it. Everything from oligarchy to theocracy, pedantry, all the way down to even idiocy, complacency, and full-on cowardice. I mean, I mean, I mean cowardice. It's a real bloodbath down there, you get my point. Now your average gumshoe might look at this and assume unrelated crimes, but a legend like Tony Big Man can sniff out things the others can't. And that's how he found his first big break in the case. A single can of chunky soup left at several otherwise unconnected crimes. Apparently someone liked to commit a lot of crimes and got hungry while they did it. Then just like that, everything changed in 2016. A new attack, this time 1,400 miles away in Washington, D.C. at the presidential election. Bigger more aggressive and more sophisticated than anything our Texas perp had ever tried. Multiple players and a trail of destruction that started on Pennsylvania Avenue and ran all the way from sea to shining sea. Tony told me he didn't think anything of it at all at first, but something inside him told him to take the trip east and sniff around for himself. And sure enough, that schnoz of his turned up a major clue. One half-eaten can of sirloin burger with country vegetables found in the bushes right outside the White House. Our perp had been at this crime scene. He was involved in this. And then in 2020, another attack in Washington on our sacred American elections. Bigger, nastier, angrier. Mutilation of public trust. Butchering of innocent voting machines. Provocation of a riot. list goes on. And wouldn't you know it, Tony finds a can of grilled chicken and sausage gumbo in a Senate floor trash can. It was official now. Our perp had busted out of Texas and gone nationwide for the second time, no less. This time he made a mistake, left his little napkin behind after the meal. Or at least, I think it was a napkin. How else do you explain an old campaign flyer covered in knife marks? Using this new information, along with his ace computer skills, Tony was able to narrow down the suspect list to just one man. Rafael Edward Cruz, better known by the alias of 
Texas Ted. Now this scumbag, he's been on a lot of folks' radars for a while now. Strange cat with a lot of eccentricities and a long rap sheet of political disgustery to his name. He just seems like the type of guy who has a closet full of various metaphorical and or very literal skeletons, you know? Thing is though, this dude is slippery like a Guadalupe bass and much smarter than most folks give him credit for. Personally, I think this sicko likes being underestimated. For years, people have been trying to tie him to all kinds of awful shit, but nothing ever seems to stick. Up to this point, at least, our boy Teddy has been coated in a thick layer of Teflon. Not this time, though. Tony thinks we have this guy Ted to rights, and he wants my help to lock it down before the Rangers swoop in. He asked me to comb this guy's life and history and see if we can establish a pattern of crimes against American democracy. If we can do that, we might be able to predict and prevent his next attack and throw the book at him to boot. It's certainly not going to be easy. Texas Ted's paper trail is chock full of strange, toxic, and concerning behaviors. This dude's file is so fat that if Gwen Shamlin weren't dead, she'd call it a sinner and stick it on a treadmill. We got a lot of shit to sift and not a lot of time to do it, that's what I'm saying. But, like any good detective, the very first thing I need to do is get geared up. So let's see. I got my pen so I can write stuff down. I got some healthy snacks to keep my energy up. I got my phone so I can listen to my sick mystery solving jams playlist. And most importantly, my case to fire phone case to make sure my phone is safe from the hard knock life of a detective on the go. I'd like to take a second and... <coughs> Sorry about that, y'all. Don't know what was going on with my voice there. Also, um, let's go ahead and turn the color back on. Yeah, that's better. That way you can see all the nice phone cases. Anyway, I'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for today's video, Casetify. Right now you can go to casetify.com slash funny Fridays. Save 15% off your order of the best phone case you'll ever buy. If you've been living under a rock recently, you might not know, but Casetify has been out here on these mean streets, keeping everybody's phones in great working order and looking good too. Starting with their new lineup of iPhone 14 cases, Casetify is going to offer their EcoShock protection system, which offers 11 and a half feet of drop protection at five times the military testing standard. That's like calling in the National Guard just to protect your phone. Oh, so you don't believe me because I don't have a cool new iPhone 14? Well, my Galaxy S22 is wrapped in Casetify and still has their Chi Tech 2.0 system. Why don't we test that out and see how well it protects? Screw you, Ted! That was the dumbest thing I've ever done. And hey, check it out. No cracks either side. Still kicks on and shows you Jen's disappointed face. They put in hours to develop really convenient safety features like their raised top and side bezels, which allow you maximum phone screen protection with minimum interference. They're always looking to partner with new artists from a wide variety of backgrounds and with a lot of different styles. Check out these cases here that they so graciously sent me from some of their hottest new collections. And soon I plan to pick up one of their Quotes by Christie phone cases, which feature really positive affirmations painted in bold, bright colors. I feel like that'll be really good for the winter when I forget what color looks like and get sad a lot. And Casetify is still making all of their cases out of 65% recycled materials, including through their own Recasetify program, which allows you to send in old cases for big discounts on new ones. So whether you're getting ready to upgrade to the new iPhone 14, or you're like me and you're holding on to your old phone, you can get quality phone protection no matter what by going to casetify.com slash fundy Fridays to save 15% off of your next order. Thank you again so much to Casetify for sponsoring this video. And now back to the investigation. Hey everybody, and welcome back to another special episode of Fundy Fridays. I know we didn't say it back there, but I'm James, and if you're new to the channel, my partner Jen and I talk about conservative politics and evangelical Christianity on this channel. We decided to have a little fun there and play with some film noir for our second Halloween special this year, The Mystery of Texas Ted Cruz. So rather than spending too much time jawing, we're going to jump straight into the cesspool that is the life of Ted Cruz, who he is, 
why he is, and just exactly what makes him tick. And just like always, we're gonna start right at the very beginning. Raphael Edward Ted Cruz was born to parents Elizabeth Darrow Wilson and Raphael Cruz Sr. on December 22nd of 1970. That would make him either a, uh, I think, Sagittarius or Capricorn, depending on how you look at it. I only say that because everybody seems to ask me about this guy's zodiac sign or something, and I have no idea why, but here you go. Now, contrary to what most people expect, Ted was actually born a little bit farther north than Texas. Now, keep going. Keep going. And there you go. Yes, sir, the terrible Texan himself was actually born in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, during a period where both of his parents were working in the oil and gas industry in that country as computer programmers. Now, Ted is an American citizen by way of his mother's naturalized status, so don't get any ideas about him being ruled out for a presidential run that way. He even took the extremely unnecessary step of formally renouncing his Canadian citizenship, despite the fact that Canadian citizenship is literally granted to any child that is born within their borders. I get it though, Texans are well known for being proud of two things, being from Texas and not being from the North. I'm not from the North, I'm a Texas man. Jimmy Dean sausage is for southern people to eat. And furthermore, this is a bit of a unique cultural problem for Ted that I certainly can't sympathize with, so I'm not going to judge him for committing to a life of Texitude. Hell, there's only one other Texan I've ever met that actually had a similar problem to this, and it really messed him up, too. Place of birth, New York, New York. <laughs> Now, while Ted's mother has maintained a shockingly modest public profile given just who her son is, the same cannot be said for his father, Raphael Sr. A Cuban citizen by birth, Raphael lived in his native land through some particularly difficult and turbulent times. Himself a teenage rebel at a time of revolution, Raphael was a victim of extreme political violence and oppression. The army became enforcers and began extorting money from the people. And so the revolution started in the high schools and the universities. I became involved in the resistance movement in the high school. Well, as a result of my involvement in that revolution, I, I was captured, was imprisoned, was tortured. Four soldiers began beating the living daylights out of me with billy clubs. I fell, finally fell to the concrete floor. They began kicking me. My face was facing the concrete one of these soldiers just crushed my face against the concrete with a boot on the back of my neck. Now you may be noticing there that the editors of that clip went about as far out of their way as they possibly could to avoid even hinting at a detail or a specific about the conflict Raphael was involved in. And with a little more context on it, we can see why. From Ben Kaczynski and Ilan Ben Mir at BuzzFeed News. As Rafael Cruz tells it, he was a teenager from Matanzas, Cuba, picked up by the secret police of the American-backed Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista. He was jailed, then tortured for days. The regime released Cruz, but only after threatening him with execution and ostensibly so that they could spy on him in the hopes of finding more young revolutionaries. After a fellow revolutionary threw cold water on his plans to join Castro's guerrillas in the mountains, he says he fled to the United States after quickly being accepted at the University of Texas as a foreign student. A family friend bribed an official to stamp his passport, and he arrived in Key West with his little money sewn into his underwear. He took a great Greyhound to Austin and got a job as a cook, because there was free food, before learning to speak English by seeing movies over and over again. In these speeches, Cruz sometimes admits, with disbelief, that he once supported Fidel Castro's revolution. I started speaking at different rotary clubs around Austin, Texas, in favor of Castro. I still thought he was the savior of the country. Yeah, I don't care how cool the associated spy movie-esque escape from Cuba was. Being the son of a literal Castro freedom fighter is just about the worst roadblock I can possibly think of for someone pursuing a Republican political career. Well, maybe the second biggest, but you know, the point still stands. Now to his credit, the elder Cruz has done a masterful job of handling this situation and has come out the other side smelling like a bouquet of crimson red Republican roses. To the point now where he can comfortably act as Ted's top campaign surrogate and is even considered something of a secret weapon. Rafael has fully renounced Castro, highlighting that he didn't really understand communism at the time and that he was too young to know what he was participating in. And ironically, this commie street cred seems to have brought him a lot more clout as a Republican pundit than he might have otherwise had. You were in Cuba 
What was going on when Batista was head of Cuba? Well, it was a military dictatorship, uh, and it was very brutal. They killed over 20,000 dissidents. Normally, the typical thing is they will arrest somebody, and two, three days later, they would appear dead on the streets. Mm. That, uh, that was what sparked a revolution, started in the high schools and the universities. There was this young, charismatic leader talking about hope and change. The same thing as Obama, yes, hope and change? His name was Fidel Castro. Yeah. But even beyond that, Rafael has gone way far out of his way to become a GOP-approved good immigrant. Like his son, Rafael also formally renounced his Canadian citizenship, which he received while working in the country, and also completed the formal naturalization process in the U.S. in 2005. Funny enough, he still maintains dual citizenship with Cuba, showing all of us just how much Republicans really do hate Canada in particular for some reason. To further pad his conservative credibility, in the 1970s, Rafael renounced his former Catholic faith and converted to evangelical Christianity, even becoming a minister of the faith in 2005. Ted was raised evangelical as he is today and credits the faith for saving his parents' marriage. Of his days in Alberta, he remembers only cold weather. It was later he learned that when he was three and living there, his parents separated. Rafael Cruz returned to Houston. About six months later, Dara followed, though they remained estranged. Ted recalled that one day, a friend of Rafael's invited him to Clay Road Baptist Church in the northwest Houston suburb of Spring Branch. He came to Christ and it turned his life around, the younger Cruz said of his father. It reunited my family. I would have been raised by a single mother. Now please note that Raphael did end up divorcing Elizabeth for good in the mid-90s. And please note that Ted is now, technically, the son of a single mother. Now given what you likely already kinda knew coming into this video about Ted Cruz's beliefs and opinions on things, I expect you can also piece together what Raphael believes as well. You could also pause the video and refer to this list of headlines about Raphael from the website Right Wing Watch. It gives a pretty good overall primer of the things that Raphael considers important spiritual issues. I also found, honestly, just too many clips of him saying awful shit while preaching or otherwise giving Christian-flavored talks, to the point where I legitimately couldn't narrow it down. So instead of playing any of you all that hot garbage, I'm instead just going to leave you with this clip from an interview that Raphael did with, of all people, Pat Robertson at CBN. And then we're going to go ahead and move on. You know, my son said the other day, a man that does not start his day on his knees is not fit to sit in the Oval Office. Ted grew up alongside of two older half-sisters, Roxana and Miriam. While Ted was the product of his married parents and was well out of law school by the time they divorced, both Roxana and Miriam came into the marriage from Raphael's first marriage. Dr. Roxana Cruz is alive, well, and by all accounts, a respected doctor of internal medicine in her local area, and she seems determined to avoid any associations with her brother at all costs. I can only guess as to why a medical doctor would want to avoid associations with Ted Cruz right now. Sadly, though, his sister Miriam's story isn't as positive as Roxanne's. After struggling with with opioid addiction for many years, Miriam passed away from an overdose in 2011. Now, for his part, all records do indicate that Ted tried to help his sister overcome her addiction, and in the broader sense of things, it's not his fault that this happened. But his usage, and I do mean usage, of this situation is a prime example of the lack of warmth and authenticity that people often associate with Ted. Miriam's troubles started with legal prescription painkillers that would eventually lead to a heroin addiction. It would be reasonable for Ted to use this as a talking point and highlight how the opioid epidemic is a personal issue for him. Furthermore, he was, and still is, in an excellent position to highlight the emotional, political, and economical complexities of the opioid crisis. But rather than taking any opportunity to humanize Miriam or use her story as an impetus for positive change, he instead seems more interested in just criticizing her personal choices and sensationalizing her story. My older sister Miriam, who was my half-sister, uh, struggled her whole life with drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, my father and her mom divorced when she was a little girl and she was angry her whole life. And she ended up marrying a man who'd been in and out of jail. She then became a single mom, and she herself went to jail several times, and she ended up spending some time in a crack house. I, I still remember my father and me driving up to get Miriam out of that crack house to try to convince her she needed to be a mom to, to my nephew Joey. Um, 
she wasn't willing to listen. She was not willing to change the path she was on. She was angry. Um, I was, had just gotten my first job uh, coming out of law school. I took a $20,000 loan on a credit card to put my nephew Joey in, in Valley Forge Military Academy. He was in sixth grade at the time to pay his way through that. And about five, six years ago, Miriam died of an overdose. It was, the coroner ruled it accidental, we don't know. She went to sleep one night, had taken too many pills, and, and Joey walked in and found her dead. This is an absolute epidemic. We need leadership to solve it. L solving it has to occur at the state and local level with programs like AA and counseling and churches and charities, but it also has to occur securing the borders because you've got Mexican cartels that are smuggling vast amounts of heroin into this country. Okay, so in case you lost track, that was a minute and 15 seconds of Ted blaming his sister for her own death, 15 more seconds of him bragging about sending her only child off to military school after her death, and then about 15 more seconds of Ted talking nonsense about how the border crisis is somehow the issue most related to the opioid epidemic. I don't know if I speak for anyone else right now, but if I personally were dealing with a debilitating substance disorder, I would much rather have a father like Joe than a brother like Ted. Oh, and he absolutely loves to bring that crack house thing from earlier up any chance he gets, even to the point now where it's basically memorized like a script. And, and I still remember my father and I together driving to Philadelphia, where she was at the time <laughs> living in what was basically a crack house. And it was, uh, I remember my dad and I leaving our rings and watches and wallets all at home in my apartment because we didn't know if we were going to be robbed, we didn't know if we were going to make it out of this, but we were going to go and try and get my sister. Things got really bad for Miriam. She actually, she was living in a crack house. In Philadelphia. Yeah, and so my dad flew up uh, to see me, and the two of us, we left our, our rings and our watches and our wallets and everything, as so we drive into a crack house to try to get my sister out. And, you know, we didn't know if we'd be robbed or shot or what, what we were gonna experience. And they were living in a crack house. She was up in Philadelphia. My father and I drove up. I was in, in D.C. at the time. My father and I drove up. Tried to get my sister out of the crack house. Now, it is hard to dispute the factual elements of that story as Ted reports it. But all the same, and I know my ears aren't as good as they used to be, but even I can hear dog whistles when you blow them that loud. Oh, and then after sending away Miriam's son to military school after her death, he somehow mustered up the courage to try and put the guy in a campaign ad later in life. My Uncle Ted has been a huge inspiration for me ever since I was younger just to just to progress and just to keep moving forward and that you can come from anything and you know your future is really what you make it and just hard work and, and perseverance is just really all it takes. Wow, that guy sure is completely ambivalent about Ted Cruz. Anybody else feel like that had all the love and affection of a post-game interview? You and your wife recently had twins, okay? How does it feel to be a new dad? You know, we wanted to stay as a team, execute, give 100%. So yeah, we'll dig into Ted's political nastiness a little bit more later on, but I just wanted to kind of keep this in your head. Ted's approach to his family gives you an idea of just how unscrupulous of a character we're dealing with here. And trust me when I say, this is something that will come back up in the story. In the meantime though, let's go ahead and talk about his childhood for a bit. It's not true crime if you don't look into the childhood after all. And it seems that in his youngest days, Ted would give us a glimpse of that sparkling personality we'd all come to know him for. From Scott Vogel at the Houstonian. Like a great many of us, Ted Cruz says his earliest memory is of being spanked for misbehavior in a Houston grocery store. His crime, according to the recently published A Time for Truth, was an insistence on playing the kazoo over his mother's objections. <laughs> Now, reports do indicate that Ted was extremely intelligent in his youth, cultivated further by his parents' wealth and investment in a private school education. In his pubescent days, Ted drew the attention of a mentor who would shape his opinions, personality, and destiny forever. From Robert T. Garrett at the Dallas Morning News. At Audie and the Christian School Faith West Academy in Katy, Cruz liked sports but soon came under the tutelage of Rolland, rhymes with Holland, story. 
story, a retired Houston utility company PR executive created a speech contest to instill in young people an appreciation of free market economic theory. It had a profound impact on my thinking, said Cruz. Austrian free market economists such as Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek were staples of the curriculum at Story's Free Enterprise Education Center. He had teens learn the ten pillars of economic wisdom, several of which Cruz can still recite, including pillar number two. Government is never a source of goods. Everything that government gives you, it must first take from you. As we can see here, Ted wasn't just your run-of-the-mill high school Republican. No, he was a polished and practiced one. Through Story's program, he would even take up being a young conservative competitively. Once again from Garrett. Story expanded his program by creating an elite team called the Constitutional Collaborators. He brought in a mnemonics expert to help Cruz and four other selected teens to memorize an outline of the U.S. Constitution. Cruz can still tick off parts of it. TCC, NCC, PCC, he said last week, citing the first letters of powers granted to Congress, such as taxes, credit, and commerce. The teens would impress civic club audiences by writing the entire outline on large tablets on easels. This era wasn't just a time for moral and political development in Ted's life either. No, he ran into puberty just like most of us do, and as you might expect from a 1980s debate whiz, he wanted to find ways to become cooler. From Scott Vogel at Houstonia Magazine. Moving on, young Felito Cruz, as he was known then, attended junior high at Audie International School, where he was a self-described geek before studying the popular kids and vowing to consciously emulate that. Felito joined sports teams, he tells us, visited a dermatologist for his acne, traded glasses for contacts, lost the braces from his teeth, grew six inches, and changed his name to Ted. Yes, this is actually where the switch from Raphael to Ted takes place. A little more on that from Jessica Hopper at ABC News. Born Raphael Edward Cruz, he'd gone by the nickname Felito for most of his life. Cruz describes the nickname often resulted in him being teased. He refers to that time of his life as a time where he was an unpopular nerd. The problem with that name was that it seemed to rhyme with every major corn chip on the market. Fritos, Cheetos, Doritos, and Tostitos. A fact that other young children were quite happy to point out, Cruz wrote. Cruz wrote that his mother gave him the idea to change his name. Ted immediately felt like me, but my father was furious with the decision. He viewed it as a rejection of him and his heritage, which was not my intention. Now, where the hell did they get Ted from? I know, I guess it's supposed to be a nickname for Ed, but I don't get it. It only makes sense for Theodore. His name is not Tedward. It should be Ed Cruz. Seriously, though, best I can tell, Felito translated to something along the lines of Raphael Jr. or Little Raphael, which is actually kind of nice, and I can see why his dad was upset. Kids just sometimes are jerks, man. Your lunch money had a Canadian quarter. So, you might be wondering if all that popularity practice turned Ted into the cool and confident king of the school he'd been aiming for? Well, you tell me. Your aspiration. Aspiration. Is that like sweat on my butt? No, no. Oh, I see. What you want me to do, what I want to do in life. Well, my aspiration is to, uh, oh, I don't know, be in a t teen f film like that guy who played Horatio. You know, he was in Malibu Bikini Beach Shop. Well, other than that, uh, take over the world, world domination, you know, rule everything. I mean, I guess it's as cool as we could expect from him. It's less cool in a tough Texas quarterback stud kind of way, like I think he was going for, and more cool in a varsity soccer and drama club president kind of way. And yes, Ted was both of those things for real. But more importantly, I think in that short clip we can kind of see the foundation of the Ted Cruz we know today. All at once he's tragically hilarious, mildly uncomfortable, and undeniably megalomaniacal. Ted would carry all of this high achiever energy we've talked about all the way into college, first completing a bachelor's degree at Princeton before moving on to Harvard for law school. He also continued to excel as a master debater in college, earning both national championships and world championship appearances across both schools. Princeton, in particular, took the time to name an award after the guy and stick him in their debate hall of fame. Now, Ted would relax this debate career quite a bit moving into his time at Harvard, diverting his focus instead to his burgeoning interests in law and party politics. He would be the editor of three separate prestigious law journals while in his time at Harvard, including a founding editorial role in the school's Latin American Law Review. And as we can tell in these photos, he began to take a more active and direct interest in politics. Good lord, aren't we happy these boys didn't have access to Ben Shapiro? 
It was also at Harvard Law where Ted found himself another influential mentor, this time in the form of legendary attorney Alan Dershowitz. So you taught Ted Cruz when he was a young whippersnapper, and what was your impression of him? Well, he came into my class literally his first day in law school with his right hand up. Not his left hand, his right hand. <laughs> Aha, and symbolism. And everything I said, he challenged me. He was one of the best students I ever had because a teacher loves to be challenged. I use the Socratic method. Everything I said, he disagreed with. I was against the death penalty. He's in favor. I was in favor of the exclusionary rule. He's against it. And he made such brilliant arguments that I never had to play the devil's advocate. You said he was one of the smartest students you ever had. Is that true or is that hyperbole? No, no, no. It's true. And in fact, I got a lot of criticism from my friends on the left saying, why are you saying that? I'm a professor. I have to tell the truth about my students. Mm -hmm. Even if I disagree with their views, even if I'm not going to vote for him, I'm not going to change history and, pre 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 you know, pretend that this brilliant student was anything now, you also now, now, just to be clear, when I say Dershowitz is legendary, I don't necessarily mean that as a good thing. His claim to fame is acting in the defense of high-profile celebrities and political clients, particularly in situations where all of the publicly available evidence seems to indicate their guilt. Recent clients of his include Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, and Donald Trump, specifically regarding his 2020 impeachment. Look, man, I appreciate a challenge as much as the next guy, but sir, would you please find a hobby that doesn't allow the rich and monstrous to buy their way into a premium tier of our judicial system? Nonetheless, though, Dershowitz's glowing reputation does show us just how damn good Ted was at all his law stuff. Dershowitz's character may be suspect, but his skill in the courtroom and knowledge of the law certainly are not. And we must forget, he didn't get famous just by defending these folks. He got famous by defending them successfully. And Ted would continue to make powerful connections like this when he stepped out of college as well. Following his 1995 graduation from Harvard and completion of his Juris Doctor, Ted would immediately move into law clerk roles for two highly influential and extremely powerful judges. The first of these two, former Fourth Circuit Judge J. Michael Luttig, I suspect most of you haven't heard of. The second of these two, former Chief Justice William Rehnquist of the literal Supreme Court, I sincerely hope you have. Now, to be fair, Ted did have to earn his stripes in the judicious, somber world of the U.S. legal system with hard work. Take, for example, this hard work he did with Rehnquist and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Once again, let's hear from Jessica Hopper at ABC. While clerking for Chief Justice William Rehnquist, a then 26-year-old Cruz watched porn with Rehnquist and Sandra Day O'Connor. We were in front of a large computer screen gazing at explicit hardcore pornography, Cruz wrote. Cruz describes the justice's reaction to the naughty images on their computer screen. A slew of hardcore, explicit images showed up on screen. As we watched these graphic pictures fill our screens wide-eyed, no one said a word. Except for Justice O'Connor, who lowered her head, squinted slightly, and muttered, Oh my. And following the conclusion of this incredibly hard clerkship with Rehnquist in 1997, Ted would quickly join the influential DC law firm Cooper & Kirk. Now, Cooper & Kirk's track record of legal and political success certainly speaks for itself and furthers Ted's reputation as a political prodigy. I must admit, though, that their sword and wreath logo looks like a half-assed family crest for a level one paladin, and I have a hard time getting past that. You would think fancy-ass lawyers wouldn't settle for clip art, but here we are. Cooper & Kirk also fucked the entire United States by giving Ted his first foray into national American politics. He was recruited directly to the firm by founder Chuck Cooper, who himself was also a former Rehnquist clerk and who immediately set Ted to work on several high-profile cases. From Jeffrey Tubin at The New Yorker, Cooper has long been the outside counsel to the National Rifle Association, and, he recalled, Ted was basically my lieutenant on all NRA matters. He helped Cooper prepare his testimony before the House Judiciary Committee in favor of the impeachment of Bill Clinton. Cruz also worked on Representative John Boehner's civil lawsuit against Representative Jim, D against Representative Jim McDermott, a Democrat, for illegally leaking the recording of a phone call involving Newt Gingrich. Boehner won the case, and McDermott was forced to pay damages damages, including more than a million dollars of Boehner's legal fees. Wow, okay, that's a lot. So uh, let's recap all that, shall we? In his very first private practice law position, Ted would work cases for one of the wealthiest, most aggressive, and most influential conservative lobbying organizations in the U.S., the first GOP-led impeachment proceeding against a sitting president since Andrew Johnson in 1868, and only the second in all of U.S. history, and a future Speaker of the House who he happened to win millions of dollars for. And, uh, you know, I, I don't really beat up too many people in this book, except one, Ted Cruz. 
Lucifer in the flesh. And all of this at the age of 27. For reference, when I was 27, I was a social worker and I had to write down everywhere I drove all day because my agency didn't trust me to be honest on mileage reports. I cannot stress enough, do not get a bachelor's in psychology. Ted once again hung around this job for about two years before moving on to greener pastures with bigger and more prestigious Republicans. This time in particular as a policy advisor for the George W. Bush campaign for president in 2000. His most impactful contribution of this campaign would actually be his work towards the Florida recount effort and his work on the Bush v. Gore Supreme Court case. Ted would not only assist in these recount efforts directly, but he would also be instrumental in helping put together Bush's legal team, which included his personal recruitment of Bush's future chief justice appointee, John Roberts. Ted even went so far as to directly prepare himself some of the arguments that were presented to the Supreme Court. Also not super relevant, but too weird to forget, this job also landed Ted the opportunity to go bowling with 70s sex symbol Bo Derek, which he describes in the creepiest possible way. From Sophia Tesfe at Salon. Cruz worked to elect fellow Texan George W. Bush in 2000 as part of his policy team, but explains that he had little left to do on election day, so he went bowling with Bo Derek, she was dating his boss at the time, who bowled barefoot with two hands in a white pantsuit. He added, every man on the team was mesmerized. Ew. It's probably pretty obvious to everyone by now too, but this little endeavor ended up being a monumental success for Ted and an exceptional tragedy for the rest of us. And naturally, W wasn't about to let talent like Ted walk away, swiftly recruiting him to join the new administration of Too Bush Too Furious in roles at both the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. But in addition to getting even more of the resume filler that he seems to crave relentlessly, Ted also managed to find something else through the Bush campaign. A timeless romance with the love of his life. How sweet! Born in California, Heidi Nelson studied economics and international relations at Claremont McKenna College. A stint on Wall Street was followed by Harvard Business School. Then in 2000, working on the Bush campaign, she met had. the future senator from Texas. And somehow, in the first two weeks, Ted and I got assigned to almost every project to work together. And uh, we learned very, very early on that we were a great team. They married soon after, and ever since, whenever her husband's record has been challenged, she has defended it fiercely. He told 27 million Texans that he would work with every breath in his body to defund Obamacare, and it's exactly what he did. She can hit talking points like a candidate. Ted understands the constitutional liberties that undergird our country. Huh, oh, okay. That wasn't so much a uh, classic American love story as it was ideal American resume. L let me try again and see if I can get a little more romantic energy. I've been married 14 and a half years, and the next president of the United States is my running mate, Ted Cruz. It's been said, uh, and you've heard, no doubt, over and over again, that you're a big asset to this campaign. What would you say is your biggest contribution? I know there are a lot of people not comfortable raising money, and it's been part of my profession. And so that was an early thing that I could just hit the phone. And we've raised over $50 million to date. Oh, with the running mates bit. Is there any less romantic way to describe your relationship than that? Also, how in the world is anyone this excited about political fundraising? Okay. I can see I need to get a little more specific with this whole romance thing. Um, Heidi, can you tell us all what first attracted you to your husband? What first attracted you to Ted? Well, you know, Ted has a very rare combination um, that I, I spotted immediately, which is he has a deep, deep intelligence, but at the same time, he's a lot of fun. Um, Ted has an incredible command of pop culture, uh, too much for his own good, probably. He's a big movie buff. He loves to play games. Do you remember a specific moment mm -hmm. where you started to think, mm-hmm, he might be the one for me. <laughs> well, Ted and I both say, and we said it at the time, it really was love at first sight. And uh, I'm not a big risk taker, so I was sort of surprised um, to fall in love with someone so quickly. But I saw in Ted somebody who had the qualities that I just described, um, but who also questions the status quo, who sees possibility where others don't. And I knew that this was a person who um, 
like I described my parents, was going to have a real impact. Yeah. I think I set myself up for failure with that whole show Ted Cruz's romantic side thing, didn't I? But seriously, it's fine that Heidi likes Ted because he's driven, intelligent, and will probably leave a lasting mark on history. She herself is a Harvard-educated former executive for Goldman Sachs with a resume that stands up very well next to Ted's. Part of the reason I took this little detour in the first place was to give Heidi proper credit as part of Ted's rise to power. Doesn't surprise me that they were drawn to another. Speaking from experience, AP students like to date AP students because it's easier to deal with someone who has the same number of classes and extracurriculars that you do. Love has to consider the practicalities of things just like everything else in life. But Heidi, I can't deny, just talks about Ted in terms that I associate more with effective business partners than I do passionate and supportive lovers. And it doesn't help that neither of these two is good at making this relationship between them sound like anything other than a pure flicks remake of Coneheads. When I married Ted, we got back from our honeymoon and he went off to the store and came home by himself. And I was completely shocked to see that he arrived back at our apartment with literally a hundred cans of Campbell's chunky soup. I don't want to embarrass you, you at all, but your wife mentioned this to CNN a while back that you occasionally, when you call her on the phone, you sing to her, you sing musicals. <laughs> is that true? Um, I actually don't sing musicals. Okay. I mean, I will sing things like, uh, uh, Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my darling, <laughs> Heidi Tyne. Okay, all right. Um, which is really corny. Uh, but, but, you know, I used to do it when she'd put it on speakerphone in her office and embarrass her. Or, or you know, I'd kind of do, you know, you know, I just called to say I love you. Uh -huh. I just called to say I care. And so once again, we see that the family that's supposed to make Ted appear more relatable merely pushes him farther into the uncanny valley in which he already resides. And speaking of which, now is probably as good a time as any to talk about Ted's daughters, who have already spent far too much of their lives as ineffectual props in their father's never-ending quest to be less alarming to the general public. In keeping with a tradition we're trying to establish here at Fundy Fridays, I will be censoring the names and likenesses of these two girls. And I will also be keeping details to a bare minimum when it comes to them. But I want to say right now that no episode I've ever made for Fundy Fridays ever made me feel so stupid stupid for doing that. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. If you close this video right now and Google search Ted Cruz daughters, you will have a roadmap of their entire lives as seen through the frame of their father's relentless campaign schedule. Bless their hearts, these two girls have a larger online footprint than Jen or I, who are both legal adults who actively pursued fame. Matt Gates may have lived in the Truman Show house, but these girls are living the Truman Show life, all thanks to Papa Ted. The most famous example of this came from a bus tour press junket that Ted held in January 2016. Ted attempted to give his oldest daughter, then around five years old, a hug for the cameras while she squirmed away from him over the course of an uncomfortable 30 seconds. It's not something anybody should really have a video of, but I can guarantee you there are 10 plus versions of it on YouTube right now. And in what I'm sure is completely unrelated news, it seems that Ted's daughters are starting to turn on him. The same oldest daughter I just referenced, now 13, recently started her own TikTok account where, among other things, she made it clear that her views do not align with those of her father. And sadly, we're not even done talking about Ted's family yet. But for now, I need to get us back to that time where Ted solicited a general in Texas. Wait, hold on. I mean, I mean that time when Ted was the solicitor general of Texas. Yeah, we all know that a true Texan like Ted can never be separated from their home state for too long, and he returned to the state in 2003, having been appointed as the Solicitor General by the then Texas Attorney General. Notably, this terrible former Attorney General of Texas who appointed Ted would eventually become their current terrible governor, Greg Abbott. At this point, Ted has so many connections in the GOP that I'm starting to wonder if he, like, lives at Bohemian Grove or something. Now, I told Jen about Ted's time as the Solicitor General, and her exact response was, What the fuck is a Solicitor General? So I figured it was probably a good idea to explain it to everyone. A 
solicitor, as it is defined in the U.S. at least, is an attorney who represents a government agency, body, or department, specifically in lawsuits where they play a role, and very particularly in appeals of decisions made by those bodies. Far as I could find in my research, solicitor general is a role that's generally considered very narrow and maintains a limited scope of practice. However, in 2003, Abbott was looking to use this office as a way to advance the state of Texas into a position of national authority on hot-button conservative issues and constitutional interpretation. Once again, Jeffrey Tubin at The New Yorker. I wanted someone who had the capability to handle appellate arguments in court, but I wanted to do so much more, Abbott told me. I wanted Texas to be a national leader on the profound legal issues of the day. I wanted us to be able to have a larger footprint, a larger impact. In effect, he asked Cruz to roam the country in search of cases that might advance the constitutional agenda that Cruz had first embraced as a teenager. Sometimes Texas was an actual party to the cases Cruz argued, and sometimes he simply volunteered to write friend-of-the-court briefs for causes that he and Abbott supported. They intervene in cases supporting gun owners' rights, states' rights, and the right to religious expression in public places. This dubious mandate bestowed upon Ted by Abbott essentially allowed Ted to act as a nationwide conservative lawyer mercenary, taking on cases of very little interest to anyone other than him and Greg and billing the whole thing to the Texas taxpayer. In five years as the Texas Solicitor General, Ted would author 77 Supreme Court briefs, 34 appellate court briefs, and argue an incredible eight cases before the Supreme Court, more than any other lawyer from Texas or any sitting member of Congress currently. And it is here where we see the solidification of the beliefs and strategies that would come to define Ted in his career as a far-right conservative policymaker. Now, obviously, I'm not going to do a deep dive on all this right now because this isn't a law class, and technically speaking, I do still have a charge of impersonating a lawyer from that incident in Albuquerque. But at least we're going to do a quick rundown of his Supreme Court cases because because they are actually that important here. Also, I want to take a quick moment to highlight the work of the incredible Aman Bethesda, I'm hoping I'm saying that right, a journalist of the Texas Tribune who compiled all of these cases and did a wonderful job of bringing them down to terms where laymen like me could understand. If you're a hobbyist for legal minutia stuff like this, I would highly recommend you hop into the sources after this article and check it out. Oh, we got a lot of great journalists helping us today. So Ted, in his career, would end up with an overall win-loss record in the Supreme Court of 5-4. and four. Although it is very important to note that wins and losses in the Supreme Court aren't nearly as cut and dry as they would be in, say, this completely normal game of pickup basketball. Yeah, up at him! But nonetheless, history generally agrees that Ted had five positive outcomes during his time arguing in the Supreme Court to four negative outcomes. Not necessarily as impressive as his clerkship or Bush days, but still a winning record in front of the highest court in the land. Losses are funnier though, so we're going to lead off with those. In terms of Ted's losses, he would argue that the state of Texas was in no way bound to actually hold up a formal promise it made as part of a 1996 federal lawsuit, no less, to improve children's Medicaid access throughout the state in Fruvy Hawkins. He would argue that states should be allowed to move forward with executions, even if evidence indicates improper jury instructions were given in Smith v. Texas. He would argue that states should be allowed to execute individuals with serious and mitigating mental illness, and notably accuse the plaintiff of exaggerating his schizophrenia symptoms in Panetti v. Quarterman. And he would argue for a state's right to execute perpetrators of CSA in Kennedy v. Louisiana. And in terms of Ted's wins, he would argue that Michael Haley's 14-year incarceration for stealing a calculator from Walmart was perfectly justified, even despite Texas's maximum sentence for such a crime being two years in Dretke v. Haley. He would also defend the gerrymandered as shit 2003 district map drawn up by the Texas state legislature in League of United Latin American Citizens v. Perry. And anticlimactically, he would come back one more time as a private practice lawyer to argue the very complex patents and intellectual property rights associated with the manufacture and sale of a deep fat fryer in Global Tech Appliances v. SEBSA. 
but most notable among Ted's wins were the linked rulings of Median v. Dretke in 2005 and Median v. Texas in 2008. Both cases dealt with Jose Median, a Mexican national convicted of the 1993 rape and murder of two girls in Houston, for which he was sentenced to death. Since Median was a citizen of Mexico, provisions of the 1963 Vienna Conference Treaty required that the state of Texas allow him to alert the Mexican embassy of his arrest, indicating an agreement to follow its tenets. Now, as you might expect from several hundred years of history, the U.S. made a habit of violating this treaty in particular regard to Mexican citizens. It got so bad that in 2005, the International Criminal Court ordered the Bush White House to review the several dozen cases of Mexican citizens sitting on death row in Texas. In concern that none of these individuals were informed of their right to contact the Mexican embassy, nor had the Mexican government been made aware of their arrests. It turned out that Median was one of the individuals who had not been informed of this right, only finding out about it through the 2005 review. And as you might expect, he filed to have his execution stayed based on this new information. Ted's arguments in the first case would focus heavily on the 12-year gap between Median's conviction and his filing, with Ted arguing that he simply had waited too long to file and that it was all now a technicality. We're going to see this strategy come up a lot in Ted's later career. Heavy exploitation of loopholes and arcane rules for fun, profit, and persecution. However, the Supreme Court only bulked this case back to the lower courts, which resulted in it coming back up to the Supreme Court in 2006 as Median v. Texas. This time, though, Ted would take a very different approach to his argument. This time, though, Ted would take a much bolder approach to his argument than he did in 2005, arguing that a treaty signed and ratified by the U.S. federal government could not be enforced against state-level governments and courts. And this time, he would win outright with a 6-3 to three ruling in his favor. The court agreed. A federal treaty could not be used against a state court. And shortly thereafter... Median was executed. It's very hard for me to overstate just how major of a win this was for conservatives and states' rights advocates. For the first time, the Supreme Court had ruled that individual U.S. states could not necessarily be bound to the provisions of treaties signed by the U.S. federal government, dramatically shifting the balance of power between those two governing bodies and granting state governments and courts a degree of sovereignty they had not experienced before. This blend of narrow constitutional interpretation and convenient technicalities would come to form a cornerstone of Ted's political career, and the victories in the Median cases would go on to be featured heavily in his campaign advertising. It was an attack on American sovereignty. The World Court ordered a stay of execution for an illegal immigrant convicted of murder. Standing in their way was Ted Cruz. As Solicitor General of Texas, Cruz fought the United Nations and won, defending the Constitution and states' rights. And indeed, by the end of his Solicitor General tenure, and indeed by the end of his term in 2008 as the Solicitor General of Texas, Ted looked more than ready to make the jump into federal politics. Now, unfortunately for Ted, the political landscape of the U.S. was a teeny bit different back in 2008 than it is today. That is to say, this particular cycle was just not a good time for the new favored son of the GOP to make his move onto the national stage. Ted would go back to his roots for a time, taking a corporate law job with yet another terribly logoed firm, this time Morgan Lewis and Brachius, who would put him in charge of defending big money clients like Toyota and Pfizer. However, following the Republican blowout that was the 2010 midterm elections, everything changed as Republicans rode this new wave of Tea Party-fueled anti-Obama rhetoric to control of both the federal house along with many, many new state government positions. And like a Playboy Cardi fan, Ted saw a whole lot of red on the horizon and was ready to pounce. And when Ted did pounce, he did so aggressively and with all of his trademark ambition, sidestepping both state-level and House of Representative positions in favor of directly aiming for a U.S. Senate seat on his very first try. Following the announcement that longtime Texas Republican Senator and power player Kay Bailey Hutchison would be retiring in 2012, the field was left wide open for a newcomer to potentially take a shot at the seat. And it was generally expected that whoever won the Republican primary would have a slam-dunk victory waiting for them in the general. Now, as one might expect, the GOP primary that year in Texas had a lot of challengers, but it essentially boiled down to a contest between Ted and former Texas Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst. 
Now, despite the fact that Ted was a very well-connected Republican lawyer with a wife who literally worked for Goldman Sachs, he was still somehow able to seize the maverick outsider role in this election, thanks in large part to Dewhurst's own personal fortune and work as lieutenant governor. Ted leaned very hard into that narrative and did everything he possibly could to paint himself as a voice of the people while casting Dewhurst as the same old wealthy do-nothing Washington insider that would talk big accomplish nothing, and let the president walk all over him. You know, the problem we all have as voters is we see politicians and they talk a good game. My opponent talks about cutting spending and cutting taxes, just like the politicians in Washington do. do. Dewhurst supported raising payroll taxes, lied about it, and was caught. I did find it amusing. Lieutenant Governor says he's not here to attack me, given that he has spent over $10 million of his own money running false, nasty attack ads. What I believe makes me qualified to be a U.S. Senator is that I have spent a lifetime fighting for the Constitution and winning on a national level. Ted Cruz, a proven fighter for liberty. In the Texas legislature, there was a strong bill to ban TSA groping. The Obama administration threatened the state of Texas and Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst backed down. Mrs. Crockett hits through security first. She hasn't felt this violated since day two of Woodstock. Thanks, David Dewhurst. But in all honesty, Ted didn't do this on his own either. Dewhurst was more than happy to act like the establishment candidate. How are they gonna run reform on with a damn incumbent? And a good place you can see that is in their endorsements at the time. While Ted was out getting the endorsements of exciting GOP firebrands and culture leaders like Sarah Palin, James Dobson, and Sean Hannity, David was content to play it safe and collect a bunch of professional association endorsements that precisely no one cared about. Dewhurst would also outspend Ted dramatically, 24.6 million to 10 million. And in fact, Dewhurst contributed more to his campaign out of his own hyper wealthy pocket than Ted spent at all. And Dewhurst was able to coast on this big spending and name recognition to a win in the initial primary, with Ted coming in a somewhat distant second place. However, Texas maintains a 50% quorum threshold for runoffs, and so a follow-up election was set for July. These two months between the first primary and the runoff proved critical for Ted. Spending increased dramatically on both sides to the point where 65% of all the money spent in this election was spent in just those two months. David was working hard to establish Ted as a slimy lawyer with Washington connections and a track record of defending only the largest businesses. I'm not going to respond to the fact that you have your Washington insider and you have all these Washington special interests that have spent millions and millions of dollars saying untrue things about me. Half the money supporting Cruz comes from Washington. But there's a difference in all, with all due respect between being a staff attorney and arguing those cases that your boss tells you to argue and saying those things which your boss tells you to argue. Cruz, typical Washington lawyer. You contrast that with someone like myself who started a business, had his neck on the chopping blocks, building a business. Look, David Dewhurst built an energy business from scratch. I just simply wanted to point out that uh, Mr. Cruz chose, it, with uh, lots of clients out there, he chose to represent a company that, that had already had a $26 million judgment against them. Lawyer Ted Cruz, still defending a Chinese company that killed American jobs. Whereas in contrast to that, Ted leaned into this cool Texan thing he wanted to do so hard that I swear it started to look like parody. Take a look at this clip, for example, that his team uploaded to his own channel for some reason. Now we all may be laughing at that little hoot nanny of Ted's, but him and his team laughed all the way to the polls that year. Ted didn't so much beat David that year as he did feast upon his bones, flipping the vote on its head in a win that the Washington Post would call the single biggest upset of the 2012 cycle. And with victory all but assured at that point for him against Democratic challenger Paul Sadler, 
Ted was able to quickly establish himself as a champion of the new far-right Tea Party and began carefully advancing an agenda of conservative Christian values backed up by targeted, narrow interpretations of the Constitution as the driving force for change. We can see this most clearly expressed in his 2012 coming out party of a speech at the RNC, where his speech perfectly blends vague concepts of freedom and America stuff with a deep understanding of the constitutional avenues at his disposal to make change happen. We are seeing a great awakening, a national movement of we the people brought together by what unites us, a shared love of liberty and an understanding of the unlimited potential of free men and free women. I want to tell you a love story. It's the story of all of us. It's a love story of freedom. It's the story of our founding fathers who fought and bled for freedom and then crafted the most miraculous political document ever conceived, our Constitution. The framers understood that our rights come not from monarchs, but from God. and that those rights are secure only when government power is restrained. And to cap off this meteoric rise, Ted would claim his expected victory over Paul Sadler and become the junior senator of Texas at the end of 2012. Now, like the wanton busybody he is, Ted jumped in head first and began immediately looking for a moment where he could enact his own brand of loophole-based legislative action. Ted is also a guy who clearly watched some prison movies in his youth and decided to approach going to Congress the way he would approach going to prison. Pick on the biggest, meanest guy in the yard and make sure you earn everyone's respect on the very first day. But of course, Ted can't do anything the normal way. And so instead of picking a normal pet cause or topic of the day, he just skipped straight to the Republican final boss and decided to take on the federal government not as a body, but as a concept. FYI, all you're getting here is a bit of context. The 2013 shutdown is mini-series worthy. But I am going to try and give you Ted's role in all the chaos. So back in 2012, the issue of the day was the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. You all know the story, most likely. The Blues loved it, the Reds hated it, tale as old as time. Ted and some other Senate colleagues realized that their chances of repealing Obamacare through the Senate were highly unlikely, seeing as it was still under Democratic control. Ted very literally tried that just about the second he made it to Congress, introducing a bill to repeal Obamacare in January 2013 that went absolutely nowhere. But with a new appropriations bill coming due on October 1st of 2013, these senators saw their opportunity to instead just yank all of Obamacare's funding in one quick swipe, which is much more practical from a legislative standpoint and still fundamentally accomplishes the exact same end as a repeal would. And the Neon Red House gave them the opportunity to block the appropriations bill's passage if they didn't like what was in it. And Ted took a direct leadership role in recruiting members of the House for this fool's errand. The thing you need to know is, though, appropriations bills aren't like regular bills. If a regular bill doesn't pass, a few people get sad, but then everyone goes home and nothing changes. But if an appropriations bill isn't passed, then a massive portion of the government shuts down or grinds to a crawl since all federal funding has to be delineated through that bill. In fact, though, Ted and his buddies were banking on that shutdown clause as part of their strategy. The way they saw it, the high stakes of this bill made it much more likely that their liberal colleagues would cave and allow them to strip ACA funding from the appropriations bill. And if they didn't cave, Ted and his guys assumed that the public would blame them for protecting the president even at the expense of a functioning federal government. Besides, Republicans love to take any chance they can to show how ineffectual and pointless the federal government is, so in reality, you could even consider the shutdown a fringe benefit for them at the time. Now, to be fair, and contrary to public opinion, there are some senators who aren't complete supervillains. These senators worked to pass a temporary resolution that would allow the government to act on the old appropriations bill while more time was needed to debate the new one. 
This would have essentially allowed the federal government to operate on the old appropriations bill until December, giving Congress two more months to get everything hammered out. And it was Ted's marathon 21-hour filibuster to block this bill that would turn him into a household name. And when I say this brought Ted to the public spotlight, I mean in every way. It certainly demonstrated to the public his stubborn conservative zeal, his stamina for the drudgery and combat of Washington, and his appreciation for the performative use of technicalities again. But it also introduced all of us to the weird side of Ted Cruz. See, filibusters are based on talking time, not on the content of the speech being given. Sometimes fellow members will help out by giving them questions to kill time with, but that can only take you so far. So in order to fill these mammoth amounts of time while also staying within the rules, it's almost inevitable that you're going to have to get a little creative with it. Huey Long read recipes for Louisiana cuisine in 1935. Alphonse D'Amato read the phone book in 1986 and sang show tunes in 1992. And in 1956, Strom Thurmond very famously made an intern hold a piss bucket for him just so he didn't have to take both feet off the Senate floor in case he needed to go to the bathroom. Fun fact, we don't have a lot of footage from the Thurmond filibuster, but we did manage to get on tape an interaction between Strom and his piss boy. Take a look. Uh, there. That's for you. Piss off. Thank you. I'll get it later. And while Ted didn't make anyone hold his pee bucket so he could deny black people rights, he certainly wasn't just there to show us how effective he could be as a senator. He was also there to make his public debut as a fucking weirdo. And I love this story, and so I'm going to read it to you. Sam I am. That Sam I am, that Sam I am. I do not like that Sam I am. Do you like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Now, I'm not going to play that entire clip for you all because I don't hate you and I'm not a monster. But yes, he does read the entire book on the Senate floor to mostly old white people. And yes, that creeptastic energy you saw is maintained throughout the entire process. And crazy enough, this fucking stunt worked. The bill was blocked and all further measures to prevent the shutdown failed. As such, on October 1st of 2013, the federal government would shut down. Critical processes came to an immediate halt, thousands of government employees were furloughed, and even worse, many were expected to return to work without knowing when their next paycheck would show up. The shutdown would end up lasting a total of 16 days, which for perspective is how long all of those poor workers had to go without paychecks in order to sate Ted Cruz's gargantuan ego. But still, he got what he wanted, and he was lauded as a conservative hero at the time for his role in the shutdown. Ted would, at least by his standards, take off the entire year of 2014, which in all honesty is probably about how long I would need to recover if I had spoken for 21 hours straight, too. He would spend the bulk of his time this year writing bills, giving lower-level speeches, and most importantly, testing the waters for a potential presidential run, which, following his filibuster, were actually pretty damn good. For context, in March of 2013, at a CPAC straw poll, Ted came in seventh place among all Republican presidential hopefuls, with around 4% of the vote. But just after his filibuster in October of 2013, a new straw poll at the Value Voters Conference saw Ted win with a whopping 42% of the entire vote. It's easy to forget it now, but at the time, Ted was seen as a true GOP golden boy and primed for presidential candidacy. In 2014, he would continue to win high-profile polls, and the harder he leaned into liberal hatred, the more love he received from the newly emerging far-right fringe. If people are attacking you, if they're not throwing rocks at you, you're not doing anything. And, and, and I will get worried the day in politics that people stop attacking me, because it will mean I'm no longer making a difference, I'm no longer taking on the entrenched status quo. 
Ted was a particular favorite of the evangelical voting bloc, which we have talked already near to death on this channel. And I'll admit, throughout my research for this episode, I expected Ted to be a lot more overtly Christian than he actually ended up being. In reality, though, Ted's power lies much more in his ability to connect Christian ideology with the processes of American government. In other words, Ted is really good at convincing conservatives that their morals should be the ones that guide the U.S that those said morals are under attack, and that there are concrete ways for these evangelicals to use the Constitution as a means to inflict their worldview on all the dirty little non-believers they don't like. What this rally is doing is it's telling the stories of ordinary people across the country who are here today, who stood up for their faith, and who were persecuted. And you know, a lot of folks in the media, that they belittle the threats to religious liberty. They say they're not real, they're, they're made up. This rally is all about putting names and faces and people to the persecution. For example, one couple who's here is Iowa's own Dick and Betty Odegaard. They're a wonderful couple. An older couple, they own an historic Lutheran church. For many years, the Odegaards hosted weddings in their church. A couple of years ago, two men came to them and wanted to have a same-sex wedding in their church. And the Odegaards, who are devout Mennonites, they very politely, very respectfully said that hosting a homosexual wedding ceremony in their church was contrary to their faith. They couldn't do it. They were sued. They went through protracted litigation. They paid $5,000 to settle the case, and they promised never again to host another wedding. They've gone out of business. They've laid off all their employees. Why? Simply because they stood up for their faith and religious beliefs. We're a nation that was founded on religious liberty, and the liberal intolerance we see trying to persecute those who, as a matter of faith, follow a biblical definition of marriage is fundamentally wrong. And we see here, too, Ted is more than happy to stay in lockstep with the evangelical far right on social issues. He happily opposes gay marriage in that clip we just saw, and still maintains that position today, while conveniently forgetting that as the Texas Solicitor General, he actually passed up the opportunity to challenge the influential pro-gay rights Lawrence v. Texas ruling conveniently forgetting that he himself had a chance to take up the marquee Lawrence v. Texas case on gay rights back when he was Solicitor General in 2003 and just didn't want to. Ted also maintains some of Congress's most abhorrent pro-life decisions. He's one of Israel's most staunch allies in the entirety of the U.S. government and ardently supported school choice as a major policy issue. As we can see in this comprehensive list, as we can see in this comprehensive list of quotes from Andrew Krokop at Vox. I mean, for God's sakes, the man announced his candidacy at Liberty University. He might as well have carried a cross on his back into the building for how much pandering he was doing. And I tell you all of this just to try and really put into perspective how reasonable Ted's presidential run in 2016 was. Even if we all just remember him now as the sniveling blowhard that got completely trounced, at least in 2015, his run made perfect sense and he was totally viable for the GOP to nominate as a potential presidential candidate. So you might be asking yourself, what was it exactly that caused Ted to flop so hard? Well... That's a matter you of principle, and I'll, and I'll tell you. You are the single biggest liar. You probably are worse than Jeb Bush. You are the single biggest liar. All right. This guy lied. Let me just tell you. This guy lied about Ben Carson when he took votes away from Ben Carson in Iowa. And he just continues. This guy will say anything. Nasty guy. Now I know why he doesn't have one endorsement from any right. of his colleagues. All right, right. John, I, I get Cruz to respond. Senator pick from the buffet there. He's a nasty guy. Of course it was Donald Trump. We all knew it was. It is hard to remember at this point, though, the sheer number of Republican presidential hopes he crushed under his heel in that 2016 election cycle. In fact, though, Trump did seem to zero in on Ted a lot more than he did the other candidates, likely due to the fact that Ted was a significant frontrunner at the beginning. Trump would nail Ted with some of his most brutal attacks, and quite frankly, a lot of these were low blows. He even took the time to give Ted one of his most memorable trademark nicknames. And in March of 2016, Trump would tweet out this picture of Heidi Cruz alongside Melania that was very clearly an attempt at an underhanded insult towards Heidi's looks on the part of an eventual president. 
And Ted's response was underwhelming, and that's putting it lightly. Donald, you're a sniveling coward and leave Heidi the hell alone. It is not acceptable for a big, loud New York bully to attack my wife. Good job, Teddy. I'm sure Donald is just quaking after that. I paid for that. You can't just take it. Fuck you, Dahmer. See, and at that point, Trump knew that Ted wasn't going to square up and that he could essentially just get away with whatever he wanted to. So let's go ahead and hear what Trump had to say about Ted's father in May of that year. Ted Cruz erupts after Donald Trump links Cruz's father to none other than JFK assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. His father was with Lee Harvey Oswald prior to Oswald's being... Uh, you know, shot. I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous. What, what, what is this right prior to his being shot? And nobody even brings it up. I mean, they don't even talk about that. That was reported uh, and nobody talks about it. And how did Ted respond to those attacks? Donald Trump alleges that my dad was involved in assassinating JFK. Now, let's be clear. This is nuts. This is not a reasonable position. This is just kooky. And while I'm at it, I guess I should go ahead and admit, yes, my dad killed JFK. He is secretly Elvis and, J and Jimmy Hoffa is buried in his backyard. Ted, hey, buddy, listen, th there are really some jokes you should lean into, okay? And there are some jokes you should lean away from, like jokes about how your wife is ugly and your dad killed JFK. Seriously, did they not teach you any of that at Princeton, Harvard, any of them? And in fact, these feuds with Trump only served to highlight Ted's main Achilles heel as a presidential candidate and public figure. His unrelenting personal awkwardness. Up until this point, Ted had been able to hide that part of himself pretty well, but through this 2016 election cycle, Ted became known just as much for being strange as he was for being effective. Notably, in a bid to allow PACs to make ads on his behalf in a legal way, Ted's team posted basic videos of routine political family stock footage on YouTube. This is pretty standard fare for all politicians due to FEC funding funding rules, but Ted really must have pissed someone off on his media team because unlike all of the carefully curated and edited pieces other politicians post, Ted's team instead decided to post hours of raw footage, complete with awkward coughs and stage directions for hugs. Hugs and I love Proud you. of you, Joey. I love you. I love you too. I love you, Ted. I love you, Mom. I love you too, dear. I love you. I love you. One more hug and we're out. It will oh, and this stuff wasn't all just goofy shit either. Ted proved he could be just as awful to his own family as Trump could, as we see here while he pesters his mother to give up very personal information against her will. That's too personal, Ted. I don't want to tell that. Well, I want to tell that, and you're the best person to tell that. Well, there's some very personal details that I don't want to go into. And even beyond his family, there are just too many weird clips of Ted that sprouted from this election cycle to go through in one video. So here we're just going to review some of the highlights. Here's Ted, for example, doing his weird Simpsons impressions for BuzzFeed. Smithers, release the hounds. Excellent. Heidly ho, neighbor. Oakley doakley, neighborino. But dad, I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat animals. But Lisa, animals are so delicious. There's the animal we get bacon from, the animal we get ham from, the animal we get sausage from. Or this booger he eats off of his lip in the middle of a debate. In federal spending, specifying exactly what I would cut, it's easy to say it. But one of the great disconnects to all the people, all of the voters, I understand the folks who are supporting Donald right now. You're angry. You're angry at Washington, and he uses angry rhetoric. Oh, my God, what is that? Oh, my God, what is that? Or when he forgets how serious his own rhetoric is while gleefully scaring the daylights out of a very young child. The whole world's on fire. The world is on fire, yes. <laughs> Your world is on fire. <laughs> I could go on. I'm sure I forgot some things. I am choosing to stop here with these clips because enough is enough. Now, Ted still maintained a hot start in the primary race, taking 11 total states, including some key battleground victories. He also managed to pick up one particularly ironic endorsement. 
And let me say, I've, I've come to my decision about who I'm supporting, and I'm not against anybody, but I will be voting for Ted Cruz in the upcoming Republican primary. I see Ted Cruz as a principled conservative uh, who's dedicated his career to advocating the Reagan agenda, and I'm pleased to support him. But even still, Ted was just never able to get over his hubris and overcome the Trump juggernaut. He would throw one last Hail Mary in April 2016, nominating fellow candidate and literal only woman in the entire GOP field, Carly Fiorina, to be his running mate. Wait a minute, hold on, this part seems important. Anybody remember why? Ah, well. Now, it's important to note that no one cares who your running mate is until you're nominated, because that's the only time it matters. This was Ted's most blatant publicity stunt to date, and it was clearly an attempt to jump on the hashtag feminism train in a last-ditch effort to ineffectually counter the narratives of our incoming misogynist-in-chief. And yet all this move did was make Ted look desperate, produce this unbelievably uncomfortable handshake thing and let Carly bang the final nail into Ted's campaign coffin with just a few simple bars of song. I know two girls that I just adore. <laughs> I'm so happy I can see them more. Cause we travel on the bus all day, we get to play, we get to play. Wow. I have never seen a song kill someone's career so quickly. Well, no, wait, there was that one time, I guess. Either way, Ted would announce his withdrawal from the race less than a week after nominating Machine Gun Carly. Ted would still manage to come in a respectable second place in the primary with around 25% of the vote in delegates. And generally speaking, he was the only candidate even in spitting distance of Donald Trump. And following this loss, Ted did seem to go dig his spine out of whatever hole he left it in back in Houston for a little while. Being the runner-up in the primary, Ted's endorsement of Trump was seen as a key part of legitimizing him prior to the 2016 general election. But Ted had no plans to give that endorsement, citing what Trump had put him and his family through. However, that spine would crumble like drought-addled Texas dirt. Once he took that position to the RNC in 2016 and got to hear firsthand just how voters felt about his withheld endorsement. Stand and speak and vote your conscience. Vote for candidates up and down the ticket who you trust to defend our freedom and to be faithful to the Constitution. And see, the saddest part of that is you can just tell Ted thought he had something there. He thought he was taking a valiant stand against the man who insulted his wife, accused his father, and made his life hell for the past several months. And the delegates were having none of it. They didn't give a shit about Ted or his family. They wanted him to fall in line. And that's exactly what Ted did, making it until about September before cashing out the rest of his moral fortitude, bending the knee, and giving the endorsement to Trump. But as we've learned, Ted has to make things as weird as he possibly can, which is how two weeks later on October 6th, the world was blessed by God with this photograph depicting him eating the largest slice of humble pie humanity had ever bothered to bake. And just four days after that photo was taken, a certain infamous Trump conversation was leaked to the press and resulted in the rescinding of several of Trump's GOP endorsements. Not Ted's, though. Apparently, the devil has a no-return policy on souls that he buys. And following Trump's ascension to the presidency in 2017, Ted would never really be able to shake off this public image he had created for himself as a creepy buffoon in a three-piece suit. Ted also didn't help matters for himself when he started liking porn tweets from his official government account on the following year's 9-11. And as Trump moved into office, Ted would pivot his political character once again, this time morphing into the president's biggest fanboy and senatorial ally. Ted would champion Trump's pick of Neil Gorsuch for the Supreme Court, his withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord, and we would even hear the last death rattle of his dignity when he wrote Trump's blurb for the 2017 Time 100. 
Now, all of this weapons-grade bootlicking that Trump was doing wasn't just because he wanted to get in good with the new boss, either. Having been elected to the Senate in 2012, Ted was due up for re-election in 2018. And with everything that Texas had just come to see from him, his back was certainly against the wall with many pundits and correspondents predicting a blue shift in Texas at the time. Further still, the Texas Democrats seemed to have a hidden weapon up their sleeve in the form of their candidate, Beto O'Rourke. Honestly, in some of my old videos, I was a little harsh on Beto, but after researching him for this episode, I really see the appeal that people were talking about. Beto ran a strong campaign that swore off super PAC money very early in the process. He specifically avoided the big money consultants other politicians use, and instead took people with no experience and gave them the opportunity to run a new kind of creative campaign. He leaned heavily on established social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram to save costs. And in fact, the creative use of resources to keep costs low and reliability high was a primary point of Beto's entire campaign. Through this strong showing, Beto was able to keep up with Ted in a way that nobody had predicted prior to the election. But even still, and with an incredibly impressive margin for any Democrat running for Texas statewide office, Beto was still not able to take the victory. Texas Ted would keep Texas red for the foreseeable future. Still, this was by no means a total loss for Beto. He was able to show the potential that a statewide Democrat in Texas could have in a post-Trump world. His strong presence against Ted brought out many new Democratic voters and led to several down-ticket wins for the Democratic Party. And Beto established himself as a Democratic rock star in a state that really desperately needed one. Oh, and that's not even to mention how he's currently squaring up against Greg Abbott in this year's Texas gubernatorial election. Just a heads up, if you have any money burning a hole in your pocket and you think Beto might be able to use it, remember, without Greg Abbott, none of us would have ever had to deal with Ted in the first place. But in the end of the day, Ted was still able to claim victory and breathe a sigh of relief while sinking back into his comfortable, safe Senate seat. And with that, I would say that Ted entered the era we currently see him in now, which I call the hypocrisy years. Every bit of my research on Ted from 2018 until the present day just seemed to turn up some sort of glaring hypocrisy on his part. That's not to say that hypocrisy hasn't been a part of Ted's brand since the very beginning, right? In his very first year as a senator, Ted would go far out of his way to vote against providing hurricane relief funds from FEMA to individuals in the Northeast hit by Hurricane Sandy, citing too much pork in the bill. But apparently it was somehow totally different when Ted pursued that same kind of hurricane relief funding for his own state in both 2015 and 2017. Hell, in the months leading up to the 2018 election against Beto, Ted would show his very own unique and vitriolic brand of hypocrisy towards immigrants and dreamer populations, which, for those who are unaware, is a term used to describe American citizens with immigrant parents. You know, that thing that Ted is. And yet Ted would only use this clout to harm people, voting against immigration reform bills, supporting Trump's family separation policy at the border, and even trying to repeal parts of the 14th Amendment. And following his re-election to the Senate in late 2018, it seemed that Ted just decided the rules no longer applied to him anymore. In 2020, Ted was a leader in the movement to jam through Trump's 11th hour nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court, despite his vehement opposition to giving the same treatment to Merrick Garland back in 2016 when he was nominated by Obama. Ted was also an instrumental leader of the January 6th insurrection from inside the Senate. He called into question the votes from both Arizona and Pennsylvania, up to and including voting against ratifying those results. And this was just moments after speaking at the Senate podium and stating specifically that he was not calling to throw out the results of the election. And a month after that, Ted would pack his whole little family up for a trip to sunny Cancun, Mexico. The only minor issue was that his home state of Texas was at the time experiencing a climate change induced blizzard with a failing privatized power grid that couldn't keep up with demand and also dealing with surging COVID-19 infection rates on top of it all. Now for reference, Ted doesn't believe in climate change. 
He supports the privatization of utility resources, and he wasn't supposed to leave the state because, like everyone else, we were trying to stop COVID. And when all three of these ironies began to collapse on his head, he fucked off to Mexico and left his constituents to deal with the mess. And in a fittingly tragic end to this crescendo of hypocrisy, in May of 2022, the state of Texas would experience its largest school shooting ever at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde. As one of Congress's most ardent gun rights supporters, Ted had a chance here to reevaluate himself and his opinions and come out the other side with a targeted, effective action plan to protect his citizens. And instead, this is what the citizens of Texas got from him. But it's never been about guns. We know that places with some of the most restrictive gun laws, places like Chicago and Baltimore and Washington, D.C., they don't have less gun violence. Indeed, they contain some of the most dangerous communities on the face of the earth. We also know that there are communities in places like Texas with extraordinarily high rates of gun ownership and extraordinarily low rates of gun violence. And it is on this clip where I will lead into my conclusion, and I have good reason for that. I wanted to go into this transition angry, because anger is the emotion we all should be feeling when it comes to Ted Cruz. Angry and aware. Now, when I first conceived the idea of a Ted Cruz-themed episode of Fundy Fridays, it truly came from you all, the Genonites. I saw his name come up time and time again in comment sections. I, I couldn't go a week without somebody sending me a Ted Cruz article or whatever the latest stupid thing he said was, or even just to complain that he looked really ugly with that dumb beard. Somebody grab him some clippers. His fucking beard is weird. And they always seem to ask when the episode was coming. I expect now that most of those requests were based not on Ted's work in government, but more just on his outrageously strange public profile. This is a man that I have seen over and over being accused of being everything from an alien to a cyborg to, yes, the Zodiac Killer. Yes, I knew about the Zodiac Killer thing, I just wanted to do something different. But in 2022, I just overall suspect that people know about Ted more for the memes and the gaffes than they do for the work he's done. But Ted is not an alien. Ted is not a cyborg. Ted is certainly not the Zodiac Killer. In fact, I think what he is may truly be more terrifying than any of those things. Ted is an absurdly well-connected, hyper-conservative evangelical zealot with a massive public platform, a protected position at the highest levels of American government, and a virtuosic understanding of American law and political procedure. Ted is effective. Ted is dangerous. Ted is brilliant. I honestly suspect that he would rather you just call him an alien and forget to look behind the curtain. But I'm not going to do that. It just seems too coincidental to me that Ted has leaned into this awkwardness ever since 2016. This is not a man who makes moves by accident. He's cold and calculating with everything he does. I mean, look, we watched this man try to defend his wife's honor, and you could all tell that his team wrote those words for him. Anyone that Ted harms with his beliefs, anyone he leaves behind with his policies, rest assured, they were considered and discarded ahead of time. If I call Ted soulless, I don't mean that to say he's some kind of mythical zombie creature. I mean that to say that he has absolutely no concern for anyone other than himself and the advancement of his own political career. I tried to find even one position that Ted would argue with passion or zeal, and that well came up bone dry for me. But even if we just take him at his word, a Ted Cruz utopia would be a hell on earth for people in poverty, immigrants, anybody in the LGBTQIA community, old people, young people, the list goes on forever. Ted is the type of person who greatly benefits from being underestimated. While we're paying attention to all the awkward, goofy shit he says, Ted is writing a bill to strip someone of their rights and securing all the co-sponsors he needs to jam it into law. Ted is the kind of individual who, if we stop paying attention to him, could find ways to harm all of us before we even know it's happened. He's only 51 years old, too. Chances are good that we're going to see another Republican president in his lifetime. Ted already received consideration from Trump for both the Attorney General and the Supreme Court. What's to say the next one won't? And Ted's young enough that he's got plenty of time to make all this happen. But there is hope yet. In 2018, 
Beto O'Rourke may have come up short in his election against Ted. But from a political standpoint, he popped that whole campaign right in the mouth. He showed Texas that this guy didn't have to be a given. He showed that this state might just be ready for something new. And now, next month, we may even see him take down one of Ted's buddies. Texas is a wonderful state with a beautiful culture that has sadly been hijacked by a myriad of bad political actors for the past several years, and maybe none more so than Ted Cruz. But it doesn't have to stay that way. I mean, look, look at this clip I found of a diehard Texas conservative shaking, of all people, Jimmy Carter's hand in awe and respect. You must be Hank. <laughs> you ran our country. <laughs> America. Okay, yeah, sorry, I know that was a dumb joke. This is my first Texas episode, and I swore to myself I'd get three references to King of the Hill. I didn't have a lot of time, that's the last one. But, but really, I feel like I would be doing a disservice to every disenfranchised American if I left this conclusion I'm doing on a comedic note. Ted is weird, he's uncomfortable, and at times, downright laughable. I won't deny it. I'm certainly a person who thinks laughing at politicians is both a reasonable form of emotional release and an accessible form of political revolution. But with Ted, we can't let the story end there. Ted's connections run far too deep for him to disappear anytime soon. We have to deal with him until at least 2024 when he'll run for the Senate again. If he doesn't run for the presidency again, and honestly, I don't think a Senate loss would slow someone like Ted down. Ted is not like the other politicians I've covered on this channel. We can't just vote him out and expect him to go away. There is always room in someone's office for a guy like Ted. So I suppose right here at the end, I can truly say that Ted Cruz was a perfect Halloween episode. Because if I did this right, you all should be scared. Ted has put himself in a position to ruin a lot of lives very quickly in pursuit of his conservative homeland. If we take our eyes off him as a society, we will lose rights and see decline before we even know it's happened, let alone with enough time to stop it. Do not let this man fade into the background as just an awkward moron and comedic relief for the doldrums of American politics. I truly believe that that's what Ted wants you to do. So instead, just make sure that everyone knows how fucking awful this guy is. Tell the jokes show the clips, and share the memes with everyone you know. By all means. I will never try to take laughter away from people. It's kind of my thing at this point in my career. But at least for this one subject, please never forget the asterisks at the end of the laugh, and always remember to remind your audience that Ted Cruz is evil. Let's say that one more time. Ted Cruz is evil. Happy Halloween, y'all. Well, I'm Ted Cruz, and my pronoun is kiss my ass. <laughs>